few months ago, we had some of my family visiting from, for the weekend. They were actually here in Huntsville, since they have children and grandchildren in Atlanta. They were kind of looking at Huntsville as a possible place to retire, and so they wanted to come check things out, and so we were excited, and so we planned all kinds of things to show them uh, restaurants, shopping places, points of interest, and certainly neighborhoods that they might be interested at their price point. So we had it all mapped out, and on the Thursday night when they were coming in, uh, just hours before they arrived, Jill comes down with a horrific stomach virus. And I'm, I'm going to spare you the details. Let's just say it hit her hard. So Maggie, Colby, and I entertained them and drove them around, had a great time. Jill just tried to lay in bed and not to move. Well, that was on, on Thursday when it began. Saturday, she's still feeling pretty weak and just... She's getting better, but she's still trying to hold it together. So that night we went out to eat, and, and so when we came back, uh, I decided on the way in to stop by Sonic and get her her favorite drink. I got her a Route 44 Cherry Limeade. And, you know, I thought, I don't want her to get dehydrated, so we'll get this. So I came in, and our bedroom it is really just pitch black. She has a TV kind of flickering over in the corner, but our bedroom is long and narrow. So I'm kind of making my way through. My eyes haven't adjusted. And I thought, well, she's asleep. I don't want to wake her up to give her the drink. Uh, so I said, I'll just set her over on the nightstand, and she'll be surprised. Oh, husband's so sweet, you know, and all this. And, uh, but as I got closer, I noticed that her nightstand was jam-packed. It had a Kleenex box, some medicines. It had a water bottle, her Bible and devotional books, and all kinds of things. But I noticed that there was one spot towards the corner where I could put this oversized drink. And right as I reached out to put it down, the TV changed programming, and so the TV went black at the second I'm putting it down. And so I kind of misjudged, and when the TV flicked back on, I had put the drink right on the corner of her devotional book, and it was toppling over the edge. So, but luckily I have cat-like reflexes, and I grabbed this drink before it hits the, the carpet. And so my brain receives two messages simultaneously. Number one is, <laughs> you still got it, you know? <laughs> and the second was, my fingers are cold. And in the haste of grabbing this, these two fingers and my thumb went through the styrofoam cup. <laughs> so they're getting... So I don't know why I did this, but my first reaction was, I've got to pull my fingers out. And so now I have 44 ounces of cherry limeade in three streams. And one is going on to the nightstand, one's going on to her new bedding and carpet on the floor, and the third is hitting Jill. And so she wakes up. And so I, in a panic, I just run to the bathroom. And so now I have three streams that are going over the bed, over, uh, it's going over the, the clothing on, at the end of our bed, and it's just a huge mess. Jill was not happy. <laughs> and you know, 20 years this October, Jill has put up with me. And from time to time, she reminds me of that. But obviously, she's ensuring a massive home in glory. But you know, through the ups and downs and ins and outs that happen within the marriage relationship, I wouldn't change a minute of it. Marriage is a sacred, sacred institution that God ordained. It's designed to be a unique relationship, even different than, than the parent-child relationship. It's so unique, and, and God created the, the special relationship with certain things that belong in this relationship and no other relationship. And it's a relationship that teaches us about ourselves. And I know, speaking for me, it's helped me to grow and, and mature. Jill's done a lot of chiseling and, 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 and taking off the rough edges. But it also is a relationship that ensures that we grow closer to our Heavenly Father. If we'll allow Him to work through this great institution He's put together. And within this special bond of marriage, God has placed one of the most wonderful gifts given to man. The sexual union between husband and wife. But the world says you need not restrict this union, this coming together to marriage. It's open for all. It's not just restricted to the marriage bed. And, but I want to make a case this morning for God's way, for God's plan. And I want to contrast that with what the world says and what the world 
is propagating out there. Tim Keller, in his book, The Meaning of Marriage, lays out a few of the misconceptions about this wonderful gift from God that I think we need to address. You know, in the, in the past, um, not too, too distant past, many believers held that the relationship between man and woman, that, that they're part of our, kind of our lower physical nature, and they're far inferior to our spiritual nature. And in, his view, in this view, sex was, was kind of a degrading thing. And it was almost a necessary evil for, for, for raising kids and, and for having children and, and propagating the world. But beyond that, you know, it has little place within the Christian home. And for the most part, most people have said, well, that's no longer what we believe. And so they've allowed the pendulum to swing away from those views that, that somehow sex is, is evil or is dirty. But they, they've allowed it to swing too far to something, I think, even more destructive. The sex is just an appetite. It, it's like eating or, or drinking. And whenever you feel the need, when you've got to fulfill that desire any way that you see fit. And sex is also seen as a, a way to, to be yourself or even define yourself. And, it, and if you choose to limit yourself to, to one person for all of life within marriage, well, that's your choice. But don't look down on me if I choose to do something different, if I choose a different path, because that, that may not be good for me. So you see, sex is primarily for an individual's fulfillment and self-realization, however and with whomever I wish to pursue it. And I, th I think that this idea is kind of making its way through dominant culture, and especially down at the Cineplex. And so I, I picked a few movies, and I want to clarify, I haven't seen any of these. But I, I want you to, to just consider the premises of the following movies that have come out in the last year to year and a half. And these are descriptions that are, are put on the Internet to, to promote the film from the producers. The first is Knocked Up. For a fun-loving party animal, Ben Stone, the last thing he ever expected was for his one-night stand to show up on his doorstep eight weeks later to tell him she's pregnant. Friends with kids. Two best friends decide to have a child together while keeping their relationship platonic. I'm not sure that works. So that they can avoid the toll kids take on a romantic relationship. And finally, my favorite, what's your number? A woman looks back at the past 20 men she's been with and wonders if one of them might have been her one true love. You know, certainly there's a relationship between what is, is put out into entertainment and, and what's happening within society. And, and for another day, we could argue which one influences more or the other. But it, there definitely is a translation, and, and it's making its way through society. According to the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, 47% of high school students will engage in sexual activity before graduation. I need you guys to listen. 53% will not. Just remember that you are in the majority. Well, that number goes up dramatically once you get into college and the young adult years. A recent poll by the CDC found that 49% of college students report having a hookup with sex and never saw their hookup partner again. 49% have had a one-night stand that they never saw the person again. But 51 did not do that. While the world says this is completely normal, and, and really any attempt to, to, to try to hold fast to any values, is, it not, not only is, is it strange or weird, it, it's futile. You can't do it. God's made you this way, so you might as well experience any way that, that you choose to do that. You can't deny your appetite. Well, that's why the book of Song of Solomon is so important for us. And some people have said, well, it's, it's just a metaphor for Christ in the church. I don't believe that, that that's what Solomon intended when he wrote this as part of his wisdom literature. Because painted in here is a vivid picture of the love story between a man and woman as God intended and you see in here, it's love with all this spontaneity and its beauty and its power and its exclusiveness. And when you, when you read it and experience it, this wonderful piece of writing and the very mo various moments of, of separation and then reconciliation and coming back together, 
And we, we see the, all this happening of anguish and then ecstasy, of, of, of tension and then intimacy. All of it is, is captured in this one book. So I want us to, to tackle a couple of these myths. And the first is that sex is somehow bad or evil. Well, we studied in, in Genesis, the, the creation account, that God made man and woman in their physical bodies and saw them. And God said, this is good. Genesis 2 and verse 25 says, The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. See, shame it is not introduced to, to chapter 3 when we have the, the story of, of the fall. That's when shame is introduced, not here. But we see in Genesis 2 and verse 24, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So this coming together as, as, as God designed it, that happens and was celebrated before the fall. Some people will point and say, that was part of the fall. No, that, that's, that's always how God intended it. You know, I chose the King James Version on this passage simply for using the word cleave. Cleave is, is, is kind of a legal term that is put in by the writers of the King James Version. It's a legal term for a binding contract, a, a coming together. It's, it's more than just a physical union. It's a covenant that brings every aspect of two people's lives together. It's a merging together of a single legal and social and economic union. I mean, this, this is not something to, to take lightly, this coming together as one flesh. And the coming together creates such, such a unique union that it's almost as the two people are joined in, in marriage. They become a single person, a single unit, a single evangelistic couple going out. There, there's something unique about that. And the Bible is pretty clear. Do not unite with someone physically unless you're willing to unite with them emotionally and, and permanently and economically and legally. It's designed to come together as, as one cleaving package together. And see, when you add sex into a fully committed legal union and, and joining together for a lifetime, and you're, you're saying, I'm, I'm going to forsake all others, when that's added into the relationship, it, it serves as a glue, as a cement, as, as a bond to hold you together. And as we're, we're brought together, we're personally interwoven and joined together literally as, as one flesh. But if you believe in, in the lower view of sex, the one that's becoming more prevalent in society around us, that it, it's just no big deal, you know, it will lose its covenant-keeping power for you. It is, it's designed to hold you together, but if it's taken lightly, even when you decide to marry, it no longer has that strength that it was designed to do for one person for all of life. I've got a, a pair of sandals, they're called Tevas, that the, the top strap and the one that goes across the toe is held together with Velcro, and I've had them for now my third summer. I can no longer wear them because the Velcro that was once very sticky, well, after times of putting it together and pulling it apart, and putting it together and pulling it apart, and putting it, well, it, it wears out. And so the very thing that that Velcro was designed to do to hold my foot in place, it no longer can serve that role. It's the same way with the sexual union. If we're choosing to come together and to separate with, with folks, sometimes you'll notice in, in high school or, or college, couples that come together, and they'll, they'll never tell you what, what's happening, but many times, not always, but many times if there's a nasty, terrible breakup, it's because they participated in things that were designed to happen on the marriage bed. And so we're coming together and pulling apart, coming together. We, we begin to lose that ability to stick with the person we were intended to stick with. You know, but if, if you're more inclined to listen to what's being put out in society and you're like, okay, this whole CDC thing, uh, that, that doesn't inspire me. I want you to to really listen to something because I, I want to tackle this from a little bit different way because I want to compare Solomon's words in Proverbs chapter 7 that he wrote as a warning to his sons with the words in the Song of Songs because both describe the very same thing and at the same time 
they describe something altogether different. So Tom and I are, are, are going to read this together. At the window of my house, I looked out through the lattice. I saw among the simple. I noticed a young man, a youth who lacked judgment. Gazing through the windows, through the lattice. Look there, he stands behind her wall, my lover. He is like a gazelle or a young stag. He was going down the street near her corner, walking in the direction of her house at twilight. As the day was fading, as the dark of the night set in, I will get up now and go about the city, and through its streets and squares, I will search for the one that my heart loves. Then out came a woman to meet him, dressed like a prostitute and with crafty intent. You are beautiful, my darling. Beautiful beyond words. Your eyes are like doves behind your veil. Your, your hair, it just falls in waves. And your lips are like scarlet ribbon. Your, your mouth is so inviting. And your cheeks are like rosy pomegranates behind your veil. She took hold of him and kissed him with a brazen face. She said, I looked for you. And I have found you. When I found the one that my heart loves, I held him, would not let him go. I have covered my bed with colored linens from Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. And you, my dear lover, you're so handsome. And the bed that we share is, 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 is like a forest glen. We enjoy a canopy of cedars. I, I'm, I'm like a wildflower that has been picked from the plains of Sharon. A lotus blossom from the valley pools. Come, let's drink deep of love till morning. Let's enjoy ourselves with love. My husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. Don't worry. He took his purse full with money and will not be home until the full moon. My, my lover spoke and, and, and said to me, Arise, my darling, my beautiful one, and come with me. Flowers appear on the earth. The season of singing has come. The cooing of doves is heard in our land. The fig tree forms its early fruit. The blossoming vines spread their fragrance. Arise, come, my darling, my beautiful one, come with me until the dawn breaks and the shadows flee. With persuasive words, she led him astray. She, dedu she seduced him with her smooth talk. You have captured my heart, my treasure, my bride. You hold it hostage with one glance of your eyes. And with the single jewel of your necklace, your love delights me, my treasure, my bride. Your, your love is better than wine, your perfume more fragrant than spices. You are my private garden, you're my treasure, you're my bride, you're my secluded spring and hidden fountain. All at once, he followed her, like an ox going to the slaughter like a deer stepping into a noose till an arrow pierces his liver, like a dart, like a bird darting into a snare, little knowing it will cost him his life. Her house is a highway to the grave leading down to the chamber of death. Hang my locket around your neck Wear my ring on your finger. Love is invincible, facing danger and death. Passion just laughs at the terrors of hell. The fire of love stops at nothing. It, it sweeps everything before it. Floodwaters cannot drown love. Torrents of rain cannot put it out. 
Love can't be bought. Love can't be sold. And it's not to be found in the marketplace for love is priceless. Thank you, Tom. Putting these two passages together, biologically speaking, the same thing took place. But emotionally and mentally and spiritually, these two acts were just miles apart. One is clothed in deceit and distrust and destruction and death. Is, is, is that how we want to experience God's most precious gift? Well, the other, as we see, is a celebration. A celebration of longing. A celebration of lasting. A celebration of love. And a celebration of life. As God intended. You know, your body can be given over to anyone. To any old stranger, and it means nothing. Or your body can be held sacred and secure for the one who loves you enough to covenant with you for the rest of your life. You know, the, the world will, will tell you, in reality, you can have both. That you, you can try to pull these two worlds together. And that sex will, will actually deepen a dating relationship and, and move it more towards marriage. But reality is that most couples that sleep together before marriage never make it to the altar. And, and couples that cohabitate before they marry and, and go through the ceremonies are, are over twice as likely to divorce their partners as those that abstain beforehand. So there's two choices that are put before you here in Scripture. She seduced it with her smooth talk versus you have captured my heart, I treasure in my bride. I encourage us to wait for God. Wait for His time. Wait for His promises. It will be worth it. Three things that I want to share. God designed intimacy to be exclusive. I love how Eugene Peterson in the message words, 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 2, It's good for a man to have a wife and for a woman to have a husband. Sexual desires are strong, but marriage is strong enough to contain them and provide for a balanced and fulfilling sexual life in a world of sexual disorder. And Solomon seems to, to echo the, the same message of exclusiv- exclusivity. You know what I mean? King, King Solomon says in chapter 6 and verse 3, I am my lover's and my lover is mine. There's no one else. It's just the two of us. He continues in Song of Solomon, chapter 2 and verse 6. His left arm is under my head, and his right arm embraces me. Don't you love that imagery? of That closeness, that intimacy? The arms around his spouse, so that a husband and wife can come together to be vulnerable. Husband and wife can come together to be open and to feel safe. And, and, and not to be guessing about where this relationship is going. Not to be guessing about what this other person feels about me. Because of the way that God lays it out, all that is put on the table. A person comes before you and says, I want to marry you. I want to spend the rest of my life with you. I want to come before God and our friends. I want the blessings of your family. I want the community to endorse this. And before we come together, I want to share with you just how I feel. That I want to spend the rest of my life, all of my days, I want to grow old with you. All that happens before. Talk about security. Talk about encouraging. Talk about just being able to feel safe within a relationship. That's what happens when God is in control. Tim Keller states this, Sex is God's appointed way to say to one another, I belong completely, I belong permanently and exclusively to you, and you must not use sex to say anything less. The second thing is God designed intimacy to be enjoyable. You know, it's not only a place for us to seal our covenant that we've made in in marriage, it's also a time for us to renew that covenant with our spouse and to renew it over and over again, stating the same thing. I am yours and you are mine. I'm with you for a lifetime. I have given myself completely to you like I've done for no other person. 
and making that bond strong like no other relationship on the earth. Song of Solomon 4, verse 9 and 10 says this, Your love delights in me, my treasure and my bride. Your love is better than wine and your perfume more fragrant than the spices. Chapter 5, verse 10 says this, He is altogether lovely. This is my lover. This is my friend. That's what God's plan is. It's supposed to be enjoyable. It's supposed to be something that is a blessing, not something to be hidden, not something to be shameful, not something to cause heartache. Finally, God designed intimacy to be enlightening. Sex is for a fully committed relationship because it's a foretaste of the joy that we have in our committed relationship with Jesus Christ. Marriage should point us to God as we strive for intimacy with Him. And after all, we are the bride of Christ. I love how Paul puts it in his letter to the Romans in chapter 7 and verse 4. So my dear brothers and sisters, this is the point. You died to the power of the law when you died with Christ. And now you are united with the one who was raised from the dead. And as a result, we can produce a harvest of good deeds from God. So the marriage relationship was supposed to, to point us to God, to point us to the covenant love, to point us to the love that He has for the church, and to, to give us just a taste, a taste of the reality that won't be fully experienced till we cross over, till He returns, where He ushers in His kingdom. We're brought into right relationship with Him. But marriage points us to that reality if it's done the way God would have it to be done. But sex outside the God-ordained union can never satisfy. And have you seen people that it's just over and over, they break up one person, go on to the next, go from one bar to the next, and, 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 and really they're, they're just searching. But these relationships can never satisfy. It's, and, and we buy into the myth, well, if I just found the right man, if I just found the right woman, then it would satisfy. No, it's not going to satisfy if you've got a God-shaped hole. Until that is filled, and until you love God more than the person that you're trying to marry or to build a relationship with, that person will never live up to that because they simply can't fill that hole. But if it Christ is at the center of your life, no obstacle is too big for God's love for you to overcome. I want to share a video that, that Lee Potts sent to us. It was put out by John Piper to advertise a book of his, but I thought it, it fit perfectly with this lesson. It's about six minutes, but let's watch this together. asked me to read a couple of quotes from a man named John Piper, who's a, a well-known Bible teacher, and he talks about marriage and how it, this mystery refers to Christ and the church. And he says this, marriage is not mainly about prospering economically. It is mainly about displaying the covenant-keeping love between Christ and his church. He says, knowing Christ is more important than making a living. Treasuring Christ is more important than bearing children. Either way, it is short. It may have many bright days, or it may be covered with clouds. But if we set our face to make of marriage mainly what God designed it to be, no sorrows and no calamities can stand in our way. 
Every one of them will be not an obstacle to success, but a way to succeed. The beauty of the covenant-keeping love between Christ and His church shines brightest when nothing but Christ can sustain it. Ian and I first met in 2005 at college and had a blast for 10 months getting to know each other. And I was looking through, and I found one of my favorite pictures, which I I think was actually taken right before his accident. He set the camera on his, his tripod. And it's just a classic Ian face that to me sums up who he is. We'd been dating for 10 months and he was working an extra job for his dad and he was on his way to work near Pittsburgh. And we got a phone call that he had been in an accident and we didn't know if it was when he got to work or on his way. And so we got down to Pittsburgh and I was just praying the whole time in the car that it wouldn't be his brain. After being at the hospital for a few hours, we found out that it was, and he had been in brain surgery for a few hours and had suffered a traumatic brain injury. God totally spared his life. Uh. One night, he was failing four out of five brain activity tests, and the next morning, he was doing well, and his brain was starting to respond again. I moved in with his family after the accident, so I was really involved in his therapy and just did whatever I could to make his life fun. We'd go out on dates, and looking back, it's weird because he couldn't talk and he couldn't eat. So we probably looked like complete weirdos being on dates, but we had a blast, and I just talked to him all the time. I knew that before Ian's accident, he was very serious about marriage and was ring shopping, so. I knew where he was, and that helped me so much. After he couldn't talk, I knew that he loved me, and I knew where he wanted the relationship to go because we were dating very intentionally. We just prayed that marriage would someday happen and watched all of our friends get married and start having families. That was challenging, but we just tried to hold out hope that that would be us someday. We decided that we couldn't really consider marriage as an option until Ian was able to communicate, but if he could communicate with me, then we could have a marriage, knowing it would be really different, but as long as Ian could talk to me, then we could make it work. So once Ian began communicating, it became a little bit more of an option, and then we just kind of watched Ian progress. <laughs> Throughout the marital counseling, we just used this momentary marriage. It was so helpful because John Piper talked a lot about primary things and secondary things, which is really important for us because when we're walking out our marriage practically, Ian can't do the secondary things like working or making a meal for me. Everything that's primary though, he can do, which is leading me spiritually. Ian always comes back to the foundational truths of who God is and kind of reels me back in for my emotions. And that's the most important thing. We're able to love each other with, I think, a more Christ-like love because of Ian's disability and just understand that picture a little bit better than if you were healthy. Yeah. Agree? Yeah. What about God enables you to have, have a happy marriage? You know. What? He's awesome. He's awesome? Yeah. talk just for a moment to our teens and young adults. Three times in this passage, Solomon has the beloved bride say throughout this whole context for marriage night and this union, three times the beloved bride says to her maidens around her, promise me, O women of Jerusalem, promise me that you will not awaken love until the time is right. I encourage you, as we saw in this video, hold out for the fairy tale. Trust God. He will be faithful to Him.
this morning if some of these things have, have brought up some, some stuff that you're struggling with. Our shepherds and, and staff are definitely available at any time throughout the week. If you'd like to talk, please don't wrestle alone. I know this is a big deal within our society and it's something that we need to get a handle on and really serve God with all aspects of our life. Let's pray together. Father, sometimes it's, it's difficult for us to talk about these things, but it's so crucial that we do. Lord, that you have a voice in this very important aspect of our life. Lord, we know that mighty waters cannot quench love as you designed it, O oh God. For those that are not married, Lord, I ask you give them strength, strength for them to wait, wait for the promised blessings that come in covenant love. Lord, for those of us that are married, perhaps listening to some of these passages or seeing this video and listening to the words of Solomon, it, it's been a while since we described our loved one as, uh, as a blossoming flower or our love as a raging river. Lord, I ask you put a hedge around them to protect our relationships. Lord, help us to honor our vows and help us to rekindle our passions for our mates and renew our covenant love and strengthen those bonds. Lord, for those in this audience, this may have been a painful lesson. Those that have already gone beyond your will sexually before marriage and those that have sinned in this way during marriage, Lord, forgive them. Cover them with your grace. Let them feel your presence around them. And Lord, convict them to begin anew trusting you this day forward in this all-important area of their life. Lord, help us to draw closer to you as we love you as you intended. In Christ, let me pray. Amen.